the, is the, the webinar is now live. Is that correct? Okay, Sergeant, start your recordings. You see recording good. Cloud recording has started. Backup has started. Okay, Izzy, can you start with this opening statement? Good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting and Dispositions. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so uh, via email at landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. I believe that's landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin, Chair. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Adrian Adams, Chair of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Sightings and Dispositions. I'm joined remotely today is Barron, Koo, and Miller. Today we will have two public hearings. The first will be on the landmark designation of Public School 48 in Queens, near and dear to my heart. The second will be on the Health and Hospitals Corporation's proposed 99-year lease of land at Woodhull Hospital for the construction of affordable and supportive housing. Before we begin, I recognize the <coughs> to review today's hearing procedure. Thank you, Chair Adams. I am Jeffrey Campania, counsel to this subcommittee. Members of the public who wish to testify were asked to register for today's hearing. If you wish to testify and have not registered, please go to www.council.nyc.gov to sign up now. If you are a member of the public who wants to watch this hearing, please watch the hearing on the New York City Council website. All people testifying before the subcommittee will be on mute until they are recognized by the chair to testify. When the chair recognizes you, your mic will be unmuted. Please confirm that your mic is unmuted before you begin speaking. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have additional testimony you would like the subcommittee to consider, or if you have written testimony you would like to submit in lieu of appearing before the subcommittee, you can email it to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number or project name in the subject line of the email. And as both items we are hearing today are pre-considered, please note they are pre-considered and state the application number. During the hearing, council members who would like to ask questions should use the Zoom raise hand function. The raise hand button should appear at the bottom of the participant panel. I will announce council members who have questions in the order that they raise their hands. Chair Adams will then recognize members to speak. Witnesses are reminded to remain in the meeting until they are excused by the chair. Council members may have questions. Lastly, there may be extended pauses if we encounter technical problems. We ask that you please be patient as we work through these issues. Chair Adams will now continue with today's agenda items. Thank you very much, Councillor. I now open the public hearing on pre-considered application number 20215007 HIQ, the Landmark Preservation Commission's designation of Public School 48, now known as P75Q, the Robert E. Peary School, as a historic landmark. The landmark site is located on the northwest corner of 155th Street and 108th Avenue in the South Jamaica neighborhood of Queens that I represent. Personally, I have a tremendous thanks to offer to Jeff Gottlieb, a relentless Queens historian who pushed for this designation for well over a decade. Jeff recognized the gem that is the Robert E. Peary School that early on incorporated the use of Art Deco in the design of an elementary school. This was consciously done by the Board of Education to relieve overcrowding in my South Jamaica school district after World War I. The Jamaica Colored School, as it was then known, would now house Public School 48, which has served the community under the exemplary leadership of Principal Patricia Mitchell and the educators and staff at PS48, who continue a legacy of excellence in learning for the scholars at PS48. This designation will most certainly be a great marker of pride and distinction for generations to come, for the graduates and for the greater Southeast Queens community. 
Queens has so much history to offer, and we have to do much more to ensure that history records our architectural and artistic contributions to the city of New York. Council, please call the applicant panel. Testifying on behalf of the Landmarks Preservation Commission, we have Kate Lemos McKeel and Anthony February. Panelists, could you please raise your right hands and state your names? Kate Lemus McHale. Anthony Fabre. You affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions. I do. I do. Thank you. Your presentation is being loaded into Zoom and will be displayed when you request it. Slides will be advanced at your request. Before you begin, once again, state your name and affiliation for the record. You may begin. Good morning, Chair Adams and subcommittee members. I'm Kate Lemus McHale, Director of Research at the Landmarks Preservation Commission. And thank you for the opportunity to present PS48 in Queens, designated on September 22nd as an individual landmark. And thank you in particular, Chair Adams, for your support for this designation. Um, whenever ready, we could go to our first slide. And the next, please. Great. Uh, first proposed in 1931 and completed in 1936, the Art Deco style public school 48 in Jamaica represents an extensive construction program undertaken by the New York City Board of Education to relieve overcrowding in existing school districts and to meet the needs of new growing residential neighborhoods after World War I. It is a notable design by its architect, Walter C. Martin, and an early use of the Art Deco style for elementary school buildings, demonstrating innovations in school planning and a stylistic shift away from the more traditional revival styles commonly used in the early 20th century and into the 1940s. <clears throat> At the Landmarks Commission's public hearing on August 4th, uh, the commission received support for the proposed designation from four people, including council member Adrian Adams and representatives from the New York Landmarks Conservancy, uh, Historic Districts Council and the Art Deco Society of New York. No one spoke in opposition. And in addition, we received one letter of support from Jeff Gottlieb. Uh, next, please. The public school 48 is located at the Southeast corner of 108th Avenue and 155th Street in South Jamaica, Queens. Next, please. These maps from 1891 on the left and 1907 on the right show the eventual location of Public School 48 with blue stars. Jamaica, one of the five towns that made up Queens County prior to 1898 was a vital link between the farms of Long Island and the markets of New York. The downtown developed throughout the 18th and 19th centuries as a result of improved roads and public transportation. However, the area known as South Jamaica remained largely rural farmland until the 20th century and residential development remained scattered into the 1920s. Next, please. Plans for a single citywide school system began prior to New York City's consolidation and a reorganized Board of Education was established in 1901 to administer the system. The prior year, the state legislator, legislature had amended the consolidated school law governing the city's schools, abolishing separate segregated schools for African American children. By 1901, PS 48 was established in a one-story wood schoolhouse, which had been built in 1886 as Jamaica's, quote, colored school. PS 48 was housed there in, until the new school was completed in 1936, and that school building is shown here on the right and indicated with a black outline in this map. Um, the population grew in the 20th century as the former farmland of South Jamaica was developed and a diverse working class neighborhood grew around the area that would be chosen for the new school shown with a blue star. Uh, next, please. Efforts to replace the old schoolhouse had begun as early as 1905, but it was not until 1931 that plans to build the new public school 
48 at 108th Avenue and 155th Street were first announced. The following year, it was reported that the new school would be the first to be built along the P-type plan, incorporating an extended auditorium wing with space for more classrooms as shown in this rendering. Superintendent of Buildings, Walter C. Martin had originally developed the P-type plan in 1930, but it appears to have been put aside until its use for PS48. Uh, next, please. Walter C. Martin served as superintendent of buildings for the Board of Education from 1928 until 1938, during which time he designed hundreds of new schools or additions to existing schools throughout the five boroughs, including 34 new elementary schools and five high schools in Queens alone. The Herman Ritter Junior High School in the Bronx, shown here, is perhaps his most notable building, built in 1929 to 31 and a New York City landmark. Martin's school designs were executed in a variety of styles from Renaissance Revival to Colonial Revival to the Art Deco seen here, displaying a range of stylistic approaches to school design in the interwar period. Martin used the modernistic or Art Deco style for some large projects such as Herman Ritter and adapted it for smaller elementary schools like PS 48, where his use of the style created modern civic monuments for growing communities. Next, please. Constructed between 1932 and 1936, Martin's design for the three-story Public School 48 indeed imparts a sense of monumentality appropriate to a civic structure, anchored with strong corner towers and featuring vertical piers with stylized foliate capitals, creating the impression of a crenellated parapet. Uh, next, please. His use of the Art Deco style drew inspiration from industrial and commercial buildings, reflected in its large window openings, originally with awning windows as seen in the 1940 tax photo on the right, and incorporated distinctive decorative treatment not seen on some of his other schools in the style. Uh, next, please. Drawing upon the decorative palette used in his design for Ritter Junior High School, Martin highlighted the main facade with bicolor brick spandrels, bicolor terracotta plaques evocative of the importance of education, stylized foliate plaques atop the piers and granite entrance surrounds featuring stylized eagles that harbor bronze doors with bronze and framed multi-light transoms. These highly distinctive decorative features set PS48 apart from other schools of the period and style. Next, please. And in lieu of carving the name of the school on the facade, Martin applied stylized cartouches with the school's numerical designation, balancing them with the New York City Board of Education seals just above the base of the towers. And next, please. Prominent within the neighborhood of South Jamaica, Public School 48 has served its community for more than 70 years. Little change since its opening on May 4th, 1936, it is a highly intact example of Walter C. Martin's use of the Art Deco style in the 1930s. Its successful blend of Art Deco design elements and massing was novel for elementary schools at the time it was proposed. And it represents a significant early application of the style for New York City schools. I urge uh, the subcommittee to uphold LPC's designation of Public School 48, now P75Q at PS48, the Robert E. Peary School, as a New York City landmark. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, I think you all know what this means uh, to me, uh, to the district, to the community, to the students, the educators, to have this landmark finally happen. So um, thank you uh, for all, all your hard work on this particular landmark. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to invite my colleagues to ask any questions at this time. Colleagues, if you have questions, please click on the raise hand button on the participant panel. Council, are there any council member questions? Council members, if you have questions, please use the raise hand button. Council member Miller has a question. Council member Miller. Yeah. 
Again, good afternoon, Chair Adams. Let me thank you for this designation. It is important to the Jamaica community. Um, like, yeah, it is so good that, that, that you're doing this. And, and oftentimes, you know, I remember when people were raising this voice that you kept that light shining. So it's very important that we're able to do this. Um, so as you move forward, are there any um, responsibilities that go along with uh, the maintenance of this uh, facility um, specific to its uh, designation? Well, uh, as with any landmark, proposed changes to the exterior of the building would come to the commission. There are a lot of general maintenance that we don't need to see, um, but things like window replacement or changes to the facade would come to us. Um, our staff does approve a lot of, um, of proposals for work without needing to go to the commission, and we do have a good working relationship with the Board of Education. So it was, um, you know, this is a hard time for schools, as we all know. And so um, we do have a lot of experience with the needs of school buildings and approving changes that need to be made. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Barron has a question. Okay, Councilmember Barron. Please unmute Council Member Barron. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panelists. If you could go back to the screen that has the cartouche on it, just wanted to have a quick comment. Can we do that? Can we see the screen again that had the cartouche? Is the presenter able to? Scroll back to that. One moment, we're working on that. Okay, thank you. Is it this one? Um, yes, this is it, this is it. Uh, the, the middle slide says cartouche. I just wanted to point out uh, for people who may not know that a cartouche is from the Egyptian culture. And what it is, is it's a framing, as you can see by the boundaries of what is the exact center of that uh, presentation. And I just wanted it to be noted that it has origins in Egypt, ancient Egypt, I think back to the fourth dynasty. So I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. And that's from our, uh, our resident. <laughs> Thank you so much, Councilmember Barrett. Thank you. For bringing the history always. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to recognize we've been joined by Councilmember Traeger. Council, are there any, any other questions? I see, I see no other Councilmember questions. OK. There being no further questions for this panel, the panel is excused and thank you again very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this item? There are no members of the public who have signed up to testify on this item. Okay. There <laughs> being no, okay, there being. Sharing on this item. <clears throat> okay. We're going to move on then. Uh, Chair Adams, you need to close the public hearing. Okay, there, be no, there being no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item, the public hearing on application number 20215007 HIQ, the landmark designation of PS48 is now closed and the item is laid over. Our next public hearing is on pre-considered application number 20215010 HHK, submitted by the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation, pursuant to section 7385 
of the HHC Enabling Act, this application requests approval to lease a parcel of land on the campus of New York City Health and Hospitals Wood Hall to Canada Life Incorporated for the development of an eight-story residential building to provide affordable and supportive housing. The project site is located in the council district represented by council member Carnegie, and I do have council member Carnegie's statement, which I will read. I enthusiastically support phase two of the Woodhull supportive housing project. I was proud to break ground on the first phase, which provided 89 units of supported and affordable housing. This, the success is a model of how we should move forward. The new eight-story residential building will work with the staff of Woodhull Hospital to ensure that the residents receive the ongoing medical services they require to remain healthy and out of the homeless system. This is also an effective use of hospital resources and promises to be a stable home for people who need it. I'm very pleased it will also provide housing for our seniors. They deserve it, and it is a blessing to keep them in the neighborhood. That is the statement by council member Robert Cornegy. Council, please call the applicant panel. Christine Flaherty will be testifying on behalf of the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation and Dr. Rosa Gill will be testifying on behalf of Communal Life. Okay, council, please administer the affirmation. Analysts, please raise your right hands. You affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and in answer to all council member questions. I do. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Your presentation is being loaded into Zoom and will be displayed when you request it. Slides will be advanced at your request. And before you begin, Please do state your name once again and affiliation for the record. You may begin and welcome. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Madam Chairwoman Adams. My name is Christine Flaherty. I'm Senior Vice President of Office of Facilities Development, Health and Hospitals Corporation. I wanna thank you and the members of the New York City Council Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting and Maritime Uses for your time today. I'm Christine Flaherty, Senior Vice President of Office of Facilities Development at Health and Hospitals. I'm responsible for real estate, housing, planning, design, construction, and facility operations across our health system. I'm joined today by Dr. Rosa Gill, President and CEO of Communal Life. New York City Health and Hospitals is requesting your approval of a proposed 99-year ground lease to Communal Life at the Woodhall Hospital Medical Center in order to facilitate the development of affordable and supportive housing at this site. Before commencing, I'd like to thank the leadership and commitment of Dr. Mitch Katz, our CEO, for fully supporting our housing and health initiative being led by my office and our AVP of Real Estate and Housing, Leora John Teft. Despite the ongoing challenges we face every day with COVID-19, we remain fully committed to advocating for housing for our most vulnerable patient populations. The development of affordable multifamily residential housing on health and housing land is a complex and collaborative process with many partners in city government and the nonprofit and business community. I want to briefly touch on the, some of the key participants in this process that have brought us to this important milestone of presenting to the New York City Council Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting, and Maritime Uses. Greg Caliste, our CEO at Woodhull Hospital, for his vision and steadfast advocacy for housing on his property, has been a key champion and partner of mine as we've brought this development to this stage. Our Woodhull Community Advisory Board has provided tremendous commitment to this project and development. Communal Life, our site developer represented here today by CEO, Dr. Rosa Gill. And finally, of course, our, our partner, New York City Department of Housing Development and New York City Human Resources Administration, providing the social service subsidy to provide the robust case management and support services for our homeless tenants. Now we could uh, advance to the slideshow, if that could go up and we could go to slide two, please.
Before talking about the ground lease and project at hand, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about why, why housing is health at health and hospitals. Homelessness in New York City is a growing problem. It requires ongoing urgent action. With over 130,000 New Yorkers, many of them children spending at least one night in homeless shelter back in fiscal year 2018. As the largest, largest public health system in the nation, health and hospitals serves more than 53,000 persons experiencing homelessness each year, while ensuring nearly 17,000 homeless individuals through its subsidy health plan Metro Plus, 53,000 equates to 5.6% of our entire patient population at health and hospitals. Historically and today, homeless individuals have limited access to social, political, and economic power due to institutionalized and societal discrimination, which leads to negative physical and mental health conditions. At health and hospitals, the majority of homeless patients are seen in our acute care services and engage in fewer primary care services. Their inpatient and ED visits are three times higher than our general population of patients. Additionally, our Office of Population Health recently updated our high-risk patient dashboard that identified that 31% of our health and hospitals high-risk patients are, are, are going through homelessness. Health and Hospitals has several initiatives underway to enhance the health care for our homeless New Yorkers. Creating housing opportunities for unstably housed patients is a key achievable component of our system's larger initiatives. It will be important for their health outcomes to better utilize our limited public resources. And with the new evolving pressures of COVID-19 and associated economic challenges, this further and only reinforces our need to facilitate housing for health and housing. Next slide, please. This project before us is not the first time Health and Hospitals has utilized our land assets to facilitate housing development. Health and House Hospitals signed our first ground lease for housing in 2007. And per our governing statute, we lease our land from the city of New York and in turn sublease to other entities. Since our core business is healthcare, we have collaborated with the city's real estate centered agencies for designating private developers for housing development rather than sole sourcing on our own. Our sister agencies have the capacity and subject matter expertise in housing and real estate to issue RFPs and RFQs and evaluate proposals and qualifications. Since 2013, HPD has been our main partner in this endeavor. They not only have had the housing expertise, but the financing tools to facilitate the development of affordable housing to best serve low-income New Yorkers. To date, there are eight occupied buildings with 1,243 occupied units of housing on our properties and two buildings with 349 units in construction. In March of this year, h, &H analyzed the unit distribution of the eight occupied buildings and we estimate approximately 1,800 residents live there. We then analyzed our electronic medical records and matching housing addresses with patients we calculated that about 747 patients are at these addresses or 40% of our re residents. 560 Winthrop at King's has the largest patient count while the fewer patients live at Seaview on Staten Island. There are a few different types of housing developments on our campuses. Uh, senior housing is low income housing for those age 62 and older. Low income housing serves only those earning less than 60% area medium income. AMI is a standard set forth by HUD to determine income eligibility for subsidized housing. While mixed income housing projects include both low and middle income units with a variety of AMIs and affordability tiers. Supportive housing projects are generally considered low income housing projects. They have no more than 60% of the units set aside for formerly homeless New Yorkers and include a robust suite of wraparound case management services for these tenants. The remainder of the units in these buildings are typically low income units. There are currently 457 units set aside for formerly homeless New Yorkers and designated as supportive housing on our land, most notably at Kings County and Woodhall. Upon completion, 72 units at the T building in Queens Hospital will be set aside to formerly homeless New Yorkers with serious mental illness. 
moving forward, we would like to develop on our land to be supportive housing because housing, this housing model specifically houses homeless New Yorkers who are our most vulnerable patients in most need of care. Next slide. At this point, we will move to the presentation to present the specific development at Woodhall Hospital. I would like to introduce Dr. Rosa Gill, our nonprofit developer, who will walk through and introduce her amazing organization and the development at hand associated with this request. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Senior Vice President uh, Flaherty. And um, many thanks to Chairperson uh, Adams and committee members for um, uh, giving us the opportunity to present um, this project at uh, this committee. Um, Andy uh, Rosa Gill, and, uh, the president and CEO of uh, Community Live Inc. Uh, this is a 31 year old um, community based nonprofit organization. Our mission is to provide vulnerable communities with housing and culturally sensitive and supportive services. And we do believe that no one should be without the housing and support they need to lead a healthy and meaningful uh, life. Uh, we serve over 3,000 low income and vulnerable New Yorkers annually um, with the supportive services, uh, housing, affordable housing and supportive housing. Uh, we own and manage uh, over 2,000 units of affordable housing in 11 buildings uh, in Bronx, Brooklyn, and uh, Queens. Um, we have, uh, in 2016, uh, HPD uh, designated Community Live through the uh, RFQ to develop the first building um, on the Woodhall campus, and that was completed in 2019. Um, and also in uh, 2019, HPD designated Community Life through the RFQ process for the second building on the campus of Woodhall. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, this is just uh, uh, the first building that it was completed in April 2019, 89 affordable and support housing units uh, 54 uh, were for patients from Woodhall Hospital and H&H, &H, uh, chronically homeless individual living with serious mental illness. Um, we work uh, uh, with the, led in the interagency coordination to rent up uh, the homeless patients. And uh, currently the care management, the case staff work very closely with the Department of Psychiatry at Woodhall Hospital and Metro Plus to ensure the continuity of services. As a matter of fact, a recent study by Metro Plus found reductions in behavioral health and medical admission for the 29 patients in the first year of occupancy. Next slide. <clears throat> And in uh, 2019, um, uh, HPV, H and H and HPV designated Community Live to develop support housing through the uh, HPV RFQ that I mentioned before. And uh, we engaged in the fall of 2019 uh, with the Woodhall leadership, um, the Community Advisory Board, um, the uh, community elected officials, including Councilman Carnegie and others. Uh, in January 2020, uh, Community Life received the HRA approval for the social service subsidies. Uh, and in March 20, uh, we presented um, uh, the New York City DOB, uh, the review initiated uh, for the uh, plans. And in July 20, uh, the H&H &H public hearing took place uh, at the at, uh, Wuhan Hospital uh, remotely um, for the proposed lease. Uh, just recently in September, the, um, uh, we submitted an application for financing to HPD. And in October of 2020, um, the H&H &H Capital and Board Review Grand Lease, uh, January 21, um, we do anticipate HPD tax credits award. And uh, we do hope that the construction loan closing and ground lease um, execution will take place in 21. And we do anticipate 
the completion of this building by 23. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just to um, tell you what this building will like in the, to your right, the first building. Uh, and then in the background, you have the second building, which is the A story high, 92 residential units, um, 12,950 square feet. Uh, they will hold campus and there will be 71 studio apartments, 21 one bedrooms, uh, the amen amenities include 24-hour security doorman, uh, laundry, community room, computer room, and a bike room. Uh, we will preserve 51 parking spots for hospital use, um, and the landscape along Troop Avenue and the Plaza Rear Yard will be, will be done. Uh, these two buildings will be connected on the first floor uh, to uh, through the chair commercial kitchen. Next slide. Um, and here we have the supported housing unit, 56 studios. These are for persons living with uh, mental illness to be referred by uh, Weho Hospital or h, &H Hospital. And the household income limits are 47,760 and the 60 AMI. The rent is uh, 1,390. Uh, HPD project uh, base, 1515, annual rental contract value at 800,000, support these rental payments. Uh, we do have 21 uh, bedrooms for seniors, uh, age 62 and older. The household income limit, 23,880 through 27,300 with an AMI of 30%. Eight units with federal project-based vouchers, uh, 1,631, and 13 units at 492 rent, uh, marketed through the Housing Connect. Um, there are an additional 15 studio apartments for low-income community uh, persons, uh, household income limit, 47,000, 760, 60 AMI, rent of $900, and it will be advertised and marketed through the Housing Connect. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as I referred before, the population, the 56 uh, units uh, for supported housing will be uh, eligible patients uh, in uh, uh, living with mental illness uh, who can live independently in permanent housing with the uh, appropriate so, so social service support. Uh, and this will, of course, we will coordinate uh, the work with N NYC HRA. Uh, one of the important um, of our model is a very strong case management and continuity of care because it is not enough just to provide a person, uh, a homeless person with an apartment, uh, but also is critical for them to continue to receive care um, at the hospital. And therefore, you know, we have a patient center on site case management services, uh, and we will uh, receive uh, a contract 900,097 900, uh, from New York City HRA. Uh, patient coordination will, of course, continue, as I mentioned before with the Wuhol outpatient treatment um, to make sure that this patient continue to do well in the community. Uh, the building, we will do other activities such as uh, educational activities, social and recreational activities. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, the design, um, the project meets the HPD Supported housing program design standards, uh, enterprise green community standards, such as Energy Star appliances, uh, water sense certified fixtures, uh, low no VOC paint, uh, photovoltaic uh, PV panels on the mechanical roof. Um, and we have, uh, of course, done uh, uh, modification um, regarding uh, the COVID. 
I and know. so we will have hand wash stations at the lobby area mm -hmm. and critical common area, mm -hmm. easy to clean surface in community room and apartment, informative signature for tenants, and enhanced to the air handling system uh, are considered in the bidding process. Next. Uh, and of course, we will work with Sanik um, to make sure that we can, uh, as much as we can, uh, employ uh, community individuals in this project. Uh, the Wuhol financing um, is 37 million total development cost, 27.5 funded by New York City low income housing tax credit and HPD city capital subsidy loan and 7.5 amortizing bank loan and 1.7 development contribution. And the project is governed by 60 year HPD regulatory agreement. H&H uh, ground lease is 99 year term H&H uh, annual lease servicing fee of $12,000. Um, and after year 15, excess cash flow allow for potential limited payment to H&H. &H. And that concludes my presentation. Thank I you believe, so much. I believe now we're ready to take uh, any questions. I want, again, thank you for your time and giving us the opportunity to present this important initiative for health and hospitals. Thank you both very much for the presentation. Uh, and, and I definitely agree with Councilmember Cornegay. I think that this is a model to follow going forward. Um, I think I'd mentioned in the past, I'm particularly impressed with the senior housing aspect and the low affordability for our seniors. The fact that our seniors can remain intact and in their neighborhoods is very, very impressive to me. So uh, happy to hear about that. I just have a couple of questions that I'm going to defer to my colleagues. Um, are the different unit types, the supportive uh, senior housing affordable throughout the development integrated or are the residents separate? No, integrated. Completely. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, you know, we, we do believe that um, uh, basically any one of us live in an apartment building and we don't know who our next neighbor do. So we don't want to stigmatize uh, any of the residents in this building. So is it totally integrated? Great answer, Dr. Gill. Thank you. Um, how does H&H uh, &H select development sites for supportive housing, uh, particularly? And, and what is your criteria for your selection? So I, I think we are um, continuing to identify uh, underutilized locations across our all five boroughs. And um, we, since I just arrived in May of 2019. Our AVP of real estate and housing arrived uh, around this time last year. Uh, we are reinvigorating um, health for housing across all of our locations. And we are developing plans across our underutilized properties um, and hope to partner with a commissioner, Commissioner Carroll and HPD uh, to look for more supportive housing opportunities. It is going to be a fiscal challenge from a capital perspective, uh, but we are absolutely, uh, hopefully not the last time we come to this amazing committee, uh, we're hoping that we're gonna be able to close at least a deal a year uh, so that we can uh, fit ourselves in and, and we will continue to advocate for um, health for housing as an alternative tax credit programs on the federal level that I think would really uh, recognize the fact that there needs to be uh, other opportunities for um, healthcare driven housing opportunities. Thank you, Christine. Very um, aggressive um, outlook. That's, that's good. Along those same lines, how does the cost of developing supportive housing for this particular population compare with the cost of hospitalization, hospital um, admission? So that's a great question. I mean, if you think about, um, you know, it depends on the type of hospitalization and the length of stay and a number of things, but from a very basic perspective, it's, it can be a tremendously, uh, a better outcome for an individual, which in my mind is priceless, uh, but also a, a cost savings, you know, a hospital bed depending on the services being provided, could be anywhere from $1,500 to $2,500 a day. When you're thinking about a monthly rate of housing, you can do the math quickly with services. 
that's a that's a much more stable environment for an individual and, it, and it, as well as home you know home is very different than uh, staying in a hospital to get uh, ongoing critical care so uh, there's definitely um, you know a, a healthcare savings as well uh, opportunity for health and hospitals uh, if I may add down to vice president that the population that we serve on Madam chair is primarily homeless individual and there are multiple admissions uh, to hospitals and emergency room, which is very costly by the population. And as I mentioned before, um, the study done by Metro Plus already show a reduction in the number of uh, readmissions to the hospitals and ER. So obviously from our perspective, it's a great savings to the hospital because of the population that we are serving. Thank you. I, I just piggybacking on, on what you both just said. How far does the program go to meet the need when it comes to uh, homelessness um, uh, and, and homeless who are at risk once discharged? So this will help those number of units. Um, there is a very large need and we're going to do everything we can within our span to uh, our, our long-term goal, I think, is to try to find a way to add to the pool of numerous homelessness initiatives, not, not compete. Uh, we want to try to be additive to help address um, definitely a really challenging, urgent need for the city. Very much. I'm going to defer now to my colleagues, uh, their questions. Colleagues, if you have questions for the panel, please do click on the raise hand button on the participant Council, are there any council member questions? Council member Koo has a question. Okay, council member Koo. Thank you, Chair Adams. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, uh, so I want to thank the administration uh, for do, building this uh, kind of uh, affordable housing uh, using the uh, underutilized uh, public land uh, one public hospitals. Uh, my question is, uh, for this uh, uh, supportive housing, uh, they still have to pay rent, right? But if these homeless people, they don't have an income, how do they uh, pay rent? Uh, they contribute, uh, Councilman Ku, um, they do contribute 30% of, of their income to the rent. And so they contribute 30% of the income. 30% of their income. And the income, of course, public assistance, um, whatever. Yes. So, so, so they if their income... I'm sorry. So the, if their income is very limited, you, you still take 30%. Yes. And how do they get medical care? Do you use the same hospital staff uh, in the hospital? Or you have your own medical staff like psychiatrists or uh, nurses, you have your own staff to take care of these supportive uh, residents? Councilman Ku, this is a, a supportive housing unit. It's not a licensed program um, per se. So what we really do is we work very, very closely um, with the uh, staff, the psychiatric staff uh, at Woodhull Hospital, as a matter of fact, uh, our staff meet with uh, the Woodhull staff on a weekly basis, and we go over the challenges that a patient may have. You know, sometimes yeah. being in the house, we can see behaviors that the psychiatrist does not know. And so by us sharing this information, it really, really provides a great continuity of care. And for example, these patients are on medication, um, and it's critical that they do take the medication um, regularly. So we monitor that so we can tell the psychiatrist, you know, where we're seeing the effect and the effectiveness of the medication. And it can go either way. Sometimes you need to regulate the medication. So we are able to say to the psychiatrist, you know, these are the behaviors that we are seeing. So there's a very, very close relationship uh, between the supporter, the case managers in the housing uh, building together with the uh, staff uh, in the Department of Psychiatry at Hope uh, Hospital. But thank you for your question. It's a very important one. That's, that's really good. Uh, so my, 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 from what I understand, compliance in taking medication 
for psychiatric patients are very important compliance. So uh, if you can monitor that, and you will cut down on the uh, many bad incidents of these patients. So uh, I want to thank you in advance for your good work. No, I have no more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Council? Council Member Barron has a question. Okay, Council Member Barron. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panel for their presentation. I just want to commend this project. I think it's an idea that is much, uh, much delayed in coming. We know that we have a healthcare crisis in our community. We know that there are many people who need assistance with their mental health care and need that supervision that can be provided in, an op in a setting that understands who they are, what their issues are, and is supportive and uh, acknowledges them. So I wanna commend the council member, I wanna commend the developer and the community-based organization for uh, modeling this project and hope to see many more of them. I particularly like the income levels. Everybody knows that's my pet peeve, you know, and, and that we're supporting people who have needs. And the question was asked about uh, how can the homeless uh, bear those costs? Yes, it's only 30%. And we have to realize there are working people who are homeless and they certainly need a place to stay. So I wanna commend everybody for the project and commend the council member uh, Carnegie as well. Thank you. Thank you, council member Barron. Council, are there any other members wishing to ask questions at this time? If any other members have questions, please use the raise hand button now. I see no other council member questions. Okay, there being uh, no further questions for this panel, this panel is excused and thank you again for an extraordinary project. Thank you. So much for your time, take thank care. You. Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this item? There are actually no members of the public signed up to testify on this oh. item. Okay, that's unusual for us. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, all right, there being no more questions. Um, Page 25. All right. The public hearing on the application number 20215010HHK. The HHC Woodhull lease is now closed and the item is laid over. That concludes today's business. I remind you that if you've written testimony on today's items, you may submit it to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the application number or the project name in the subject heading. I'd like to thank the applicants, members of the public, my colleagues, of course, subcommittee council, land use staff, and the sergeants at arms for participating in today's hearing. 